Greetings in the name of Jesus, our blessed hope. I am Dave Reagan, Senior Evangelist for Lamb and Lion Ministries, and I am delighted to have with me this week a very special guest by the name of Mark Gabriel. Mark is a former professor of Islamic history at Al-Hazar University in Cairo, Egypt, the world's premier Islamic university. Welcome to Texas, Mark. Thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me on this program. Well, Mark, uh, is this your first visit to Texas? Uh, no, this is actually second visit to uh, to Dallas. I see. Okay. But I visited te Texas, uh, especially Houston, oh. uh, more than once. Did you know that Texans refer to Texas as God's country? <laughs> this is first time I know that. <laughs> you, you know That's, that. Yeah. <laughs> you know how t proud Texans are of Texas, huh? Amen. <laughs> okay. Folks, uh, Mark has very graciously agreed to do two interviews with us. This week, we're going to focus on his remarkable personal story and what it reveals about the nature of Islam. Next week, the Lord willing, we will discuss with Mark the nature of the Quran and the contrast between Muhammad and Jesus. But before I ask Mark my first question, let me point out that he is a very gifted writer. Since he came to this country just a few years ago, he has written several bestsellers. The first one, this one, Islam and Terrorism is really fantastic. And he has written some others. For example, he has written one, the second one was called Islam and the Jews, and the next one was called Jesus and Mohammed. This is his newest book that has just come out. Later in our program, we'll tell you how you can get a copy of Islam and Terrorism. It is must reading for anyone who wants to understand the war against terrorism in which this nation is engaged. Mark, let's begin by talking about your upbringing in Egypt. Uh, were you born and raised in Cairo? No, actually I was born uh, in the south part of Egypt, and my family was moved to Cairo when I was almost uh, 14 years old. Oh, when yes. you were 14? Yes. Okay, were your parents strict Muslims? They are. Uh, very devout. Not the secular type of Muslim that we often encounter um, in this no, country. No. In fact, you had an uncle who was an imam, wasn't he? He's a clerk, yeah, Muslim clerk and uh, imam also. Wasn't he the yes. one who first began to inspire you to uh, memorize the Quran? Yes, he took me when I was five years old and he started helping me memorizing the, uh, the Quran. And is it true that by the time you were 12 years old that you had the Quran memorized? Absolutely. I spent uh, almost seven years exactly to finish memorizing the entire book. Now, uh, Mark, yes. I have a copy of the Quran that is about yes. that thick, and yes. it's in very small print. <laughs> yes. We're talking about quite a lot of material there. Exactly. The size of the Quran actually is exactly like the size of the New Testament. So you had a book, the equivalent of the New Testament in length, exactly. memorized by the time you were 12 years old. By heart, absolutely. And you yes. had it memorized in classical Arabic, right? Exactly, because the language of the Quran, it's classic Arabic. It's not dialect Arabic. It's not the, the Arabic you speak on the streets. No, absolutely and not. And probably at the age yes. of 12, you didn't understand all that, did you? No, even, even when I finished uh, my secondary school, uh, only when I start to really, um, my uh, high school, I start to recognize the meaning of um, the verses of the Quran and the yes. teaching of the Quran. But it was a development, you see, from uh, the time I finished the Quran when I was 12 years old, till I finished my bachelor degree. It, the, from time to time it was a development taking place in understanding the meaning of this yes. book. But when I finished my bachelor degree, I was already um, have the proper understanding of the meaning of this book. And why was it important for you to memorize the Quran as a child? Why, why did anybody put any importance on that? Was, is that something important in Islamic society? Uh, this is actually, um, it came as a culture, mainly it's Islamic culture. And it wasn't just from the past 10 years or 50 years, it's from the very early time, the first century of Islam, Muslims start to take care of giving the Quran from generation to generation I see. by memorizing the book by heart. Okay. Yes. Now, were you ever exposed to any Christians while you were growing up, either missionaries or Coptic uh, Christians, uh, the, the basic Christianity of, of Egypt? Uh, absolutely. I saw um, Christians living in my neighborhood, living in my country, Egypt, as minority. But the things that uh, Christianity in Egypt 
uh, didn't have really the power to influence Muslims and uh, this is the reason why I wasn't influenced by this type of Christianity during all my life because the Christianity in Egypt is so tradition. Yes. M more than 90% of Egyptian Christians, they are tradition. Uh, there a is very liturgical type Exactly. Of yes. But there is one incident happened when I was a little child with a Christian priest from that church. That, that, what happened at that time really was uh, left a huge influence over my spiritual life. Tell us about it. Um, I was really um, become very upset and very angry, uh, you see, um, of Christians and the Jews because of the teaching I started to receive every day in my school, especially when I was in my secondary school at Al Azhar um, Islamic Institute. Um, so one day I decided really to um, fire the Christians and so I find a Christian priest in that church was using the road outside of my house going from his place to his monastery every day. So every day I stand in front of my house and I start to just hit him with the, um, with the stones and with, you see. How old were you at that time? And that time I was 13 years old. And you're throwing stones at a I, Coptic absolutely, priest? Absolutely, and I injured his head. I oh. injured him in his head terribly and they took him to the hospital. But this man, when he get out of the hospital, he just came just to find out what's going on with me, why I'm treating him that way. He came back and found you? Yes, <laughs> yes. And uh, he know my house, he know my family even. So anyway, this man, he didn't come to revenge or to treat me in the same way, but he came to advise me that there is a fire inside me, and that fire is going to burn me mm. before burning others. So, and he came to show me, or to tell me, that he forgive me. Even I injured him and I caused big injury to him. He just came to show me that he loves me, he forgive me, and he said there is no reason for you to hate me or to treat me that way. That really impressed you, didn't it? Absolutely. This is what really influenced my spiritual life, even when I grow up and I become one of the best students in my university. Now you were basically sitting on top of the world as a person who was a professor of Islamic history at Al-Azhar University. You were also a Muslim imam uh, at yes. a, a mosque in Giza, right? Yes, Giza City, uh, yes. I mean, you had all the prestige in the world, and yet one day you made a comment. Uh, I think I, I had it marked here. It's in your latest book, uh, Jesus and Muhammad. You were you were a person who questioned things and you were told at the university you don't question you were told that exactly you don't question and you kept questioning and one day in a conversation with colleagues you made this statement we say the Quran is directly from Allah but I doubt it I see in it the thoughts of man and not the words of God absolutely And the moment those words came out of your mouth you knew your fate was sealed right absolutely what happened that night um, and uh, this is well, uh, this is what happened in a meeting between me and other professors from the university. And uh, they just uh, met with me and they discussed um, what is going on and what they right. heard from the student. They was think that um, I, I've been under pressure of foreigner influence or um, Christian influence. or So they just want to find out why I'm doubting Islam, why I'm just... Right. So, and I said that this statement to and them... And then what happened that night? Uh, they become very upset. They kicked me out of the university. They fired me. The university fired me. And uh, in the same day, in evening time, I was kidnapped by Egyptian secret police because they accused me that I convert from Islam. We'll come back in just a moment, yes. and I want you to tell us what happened to you when you were kidnapped by the uh, secret police. Folks, uh, we are going to take a brief break at this point, and when we return, we'll hear the incredible story of what happened to Mark simply because he questioned some aspects of Islam. Now you were telling us that you were arrested by the secret police of the Egyptian government for simply questioning some of the principles of Islam. What happened to you after that arrest? Um, they put me in the uh, little cell in, uh, in the, uh, uh, the headquarters of Egyptian secret service in the middle or the center of Cairo. Uh, they put me for three days with no food, with no water, mm -hmm. And uh, in the fourth day, they start to interrogate me. They took me to one of the offices. 
maybe it's in the six or the seven floors, and uh, inter interrogating me during the day. And that fourth day, they start giving me food and water, and because they want to stimulate me, I just want to get information that they can. And uh, they find out during the day, they cannot just get what they, they're looking for. And they start interrogating me during the evening time. So the evening time, it was the time of torture. Hmm. Um, with cigarette, they burned me with cigarette in different places in my, my body. Yeah, sure. mm -hmm. And you can see here in uh, my hand, um, they, um, they beat me, um, they put me in cold water, they put me in a little, uh, 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 in, a, in a tank full, you see, um, filled with water, and they put uh, hungry rats inside that tank, and they put me inside the tank. So you had rats for the whole crawling over night. You? All night? All night, and the rats just swimming over the water, you see, around my head. And Did the rats bite you? No, well, no, 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 at all. This no. is like Daniel and the lion's den. And uh, <laughs> the next day they took me out, and uh, I was just um, surprised that I'm still alive. And they, But I don't know what is the next. So, And after that, they put me in a little cell with a vicious, hungry dog. And when they put me in a room and they close the door and I sit in the middle of the room and I was thinking that I'm going to be beaten by the, by, 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 by the dog. Dog, it will um, eat me, it will, so, but I was surprised when I found the dog. He just came and sitting in my right hand side. In fact, he licked you on the ear, didn't he? And he licked me in my ears. <laughs> and... They must have thought that you were Satan or something they, to have such they, power. They said that. They said that <laughs> this is the human being or something else. They wasn't really, um, um, they believed, they was believed that there is any, there is some spirit or some So at that point, didn't they, power, yeah. didn't they decide to just turn you over to some guys in a cell and tell them that you had renounced uh, uh, Islam and let them kill you? Uh, yeah, so this is, this is uh, the understanding that uh, I've been questioned by professors at the university. I've been fired by the university. To them, means this guy, he's just out of Islam now. He's converted now. Um, In fact, they wanted to find out what missionary had converted you, didn't they? Exactly. And you hadn't been converted. It, exactly. No, I was have no idea about Christianity in that time, yes. about Christ. I never even... Um, um, discussed Christianity, but um, automatically in Egypt, when someone decides to leave Islam, yes. they will accuse him automatically that he became under pressure from church or some Christian, and he converted to Christianity. Well, how in the world did you get out of that situation without losing your life? Um, the, I was crying before the God who was created me in that time. I wasn't know who is. Yes. Um, and uh, after 15 days, uh, my uncle, he was working as the vice president of Egyptian parliament. He was visiting Russia at that time. When he came back and he heard about my, um, my kidnapping, and so he came with permission from the government, and he came with his car, and he took me out of the so prison. So you got out of prison due to the political influence of a relative who had been out of the country. Absolutely. And then when you went home, I understand your father tried to kill you. My father, he tried to kill me later, after one year, uh, searching for God, uh, find out who is God, you see, till I received a Bible from a Christian pharmacy. So when I read, I start reading the Bible, I start to find the truth about Christ. When I, after I give my life to, do, to the Lord, I lived uh, one year, uh, one year, whole year as a secret believer. So you when were... my father heard about my conversion, he Ooh. shot me with his own gun. He tried to kill so me. So you were given a Bible by a Christian pharmacist. And that brought you to the Lord? Yes. And when that happened, your father decided to kill you for the honor of the family, I guess? Uh, because, yeah, for, uh, he just felt there is a shame uh, going to be over him and he, all the life, and, or, or the family, even the community. The and people. so he shot at you several times and all the bullets missed? No one bullet missed me, about maybe five, six bullets. I understand that your sister mm. finally got your passport, got you out of the country, and where did you go? Uh, when my father, he just uh, shot me and tried to kill me, I was just... I was running away yes. from his face, and I went to my sister, and in my sister's house, uh, I put the whole situation in front of the Lord, and the Lord showed me to get out of Egypt in the same evening, same day, 
my sister helped me. She, she brought my stuff. And where did you go to when you fled? I fle fled to South Africa by South the road, Africa. traveling from Cairo to South Africa for three months over the road. And uh, I was the first Egyptian who did overland journey between Cairo and Johannesburg um, for take the trip take almost three and, months. Okay, and so then you get to South Africa, and did you meet some Christians there? Yes, in South Africa I met with uh, many Christians and uh, many churches. They start to hear about my story because the public media in South Africa, they wrote article and published articles about my story. and my Is it true? assassins were sent to South Africa to kill you? Um, absolutely. Um, in South Africa, especially after I wrote my first book in South Africa, and my activity became very well known, and Muslim community, they felt they threatened by that my activity there, and by this book was released there in Johannesburg in 1996, and they tried to end my life there so two this times. So re this religion of peace, just because you question Islam, this religion of peace kidnaps you, tortures you, tries to kill you, yeah. and even sends assassins to kill you in South Africa. Yeah. That's some religion yeah. of peace, isn't it? Yeah, this is, uh, uh, this is how the world really um, been um, um, deceived by the media, by the uh, world media, the secular media, by um, Islam. It's not, uh, it's not religion of peace. Well, Mark, we're going to pause again here, folks, and uh, we'll be back with you in just a moment. Okay, folks, let's just take a moment to summarize. Mark was a professor of Islamic history at Al-Azhar University in Cairo, and he was also serving as a Muslim imam, the equivalent of a pastor of a mosque, when he would openly question some things about Islam. Uh, he was immediately arrested, he was tortured for several weeks, and when he was finally released and went home, his own father tried to kill him. Uh, you were finally able to escape to South Africa, Mark. Yes. And tell us, when you arrived in South Africa, you said you met some Christian friends. In fact, I think you lived with a Christian family for a while. Yes. But let's just back up for a moment, because uh, I know you became a Christian before you left uh, uh, Egypt. Egypt, yes. What appealed to you about Christianity? Uh, the, uh, before I met with Christ, I lived for 34 years under Islam, believing in Islam, serving Islam, learning about Islam, teaching about Islam. And I lived another year. Uh, without faith, after I find myself, I'm already out of Islam. So I lived for 35 years searching for peace, searching for the true God, who is going to show me that He loves me more than anything in this world. Through the Quran, through the teaching of the Prophet of Islam, I was never experienced something like that. So when I get the Bible and from the doctor pharmacy, before I get the Bible, I lived for a whole year searching for God, asking my, myself who God can be. I had terrible headache. Hmm. Every day, go to the, the, chemi the uh, doctor pharmacy to get headache tablets. So, and finally she gave me the Bible and she gave me the headache tablets. I took the Bible in one hand and headache tablets in one, another hand. When I started reading the Bible, I met with the Lord Jesus Christ face to face through the Sermon of the Mountain in Matthew chapter 5, mm. telling me about love. Love your enemy. Not kill your enemy. Not kill your enemy. <laughs> so the word of the Bible, the word of Jesus Christ, in that evening came to me it's just like a, a beautiful rain. And so you began to find the peace that had eluded you all those exactly. years. Exactly. For peace, forgiveness, I felt for the first time that my sins has been forgiven. Hallelujah. And I being justified already by the blood of Jesus. I was lived for 35 years with guilt. The guilt of my sin, the guilt of, 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 of um, living as a, as a lost person. I don't know who going to forgive my sin. I don't know who going to rescue me from the punishment of Allah. I, am, I don't have no assurance that I can be in the right place, you see, Actually, to live the eternity. In Islam, you never really know for sure whether you're saved or not. Mohammed didn't know whether he was saved or not. Uh, absolutely not. Isn't Absol that something? Yes, this is true. Now, very quickly, we only have about two minutes in this segment. When you finally got to the United States, 
You were given religious asylum in this country. Yes. And you had a remarkable experience in Washington, D.C. when somebody said that there was a, uh, a Muslim imam who was going to be speaking at uh, a university. George Mason yeah. University, And you went yes. to hear him speak. Yes. And what did you find out about I went there. I, f I shocked. I found this man. He was a Baptist pastor from Texas. A Baptist pastor from Texas? Yeah. And he converted to Islam. <laughs> and he now preaching, you see, for Islam in George Mason um, uh, University and sharing his, his, his uh, testimony. So, and after he finished his speech, uh, he asked if there is anyone he has question to raise his hand. I find my, my hand it was the first <laughs> hand. So when I stood up, I did ask him, sir, um, when did you take that decision to leave Christian to become Muslim? He said, eight years. I said, oh, this is like myself. And my next question, since you convert to Islam and you left Christianity, did any church or any Christians order to kill you because the Bible said that the penalty of Christian apostasy is death? He's, he said no. Did the FBI persecuted you here or arrested you here or tortured you here because you left Christianity to become a Muslim? He said no. I said to him, sir, I'm a human being like you. And I have the right to take a decision to change my religion or my faith like you. And I was a Muslim like you. I was an imam as you was a pastor. And I took the same decision you took. But the difference between me and you, that I was treated by Islam. I fired from my university. I kidnapped by the secret police. I've been tortured. I lost my family. I lost my country. And the sword of Islam is on my neck wherever I go. Why? Because the Quran said so. <laughs> that the penalty of a Muslim apostasy, it's death. That is an incredible story. And in yes. fact, folks, uh, there's something about this uh, particular story that he did not mention, and that is that when the man stopped speaking and asked for questions, he was the first to raise his hand, stood up, and first of all identified himself as a former professor of Islamic history at uh, the university. And the imam was so impressed by that that he said, oh, honored professor, please come up here and take over the podium. And the next thing he knew, he was on the stage at the podium exactly. in charge of the whole meeting Absolutely. and asking him questions. Well, she, yes. Isn't it amazing he how the Lord shocked. works? He was shocked, exactly. And, and, and showed immediately yes. that uh, the difference between Christianity and Islam, that, that he leaves Islam and everyone tries to kill him and kicks him out of his family. He leaves Christianity and none of that happens to him. And yet Islam is supposed to be the, the religion of peace. He's still enjoying his life in, in, in America. Because of the freedom brought to this country through the Christian and the biblical principles. Yes. You know, the point that you made a few moments ago about uh, no one in uh, Islam knowing for sure whether they're ever saved or not. Yes. Unless they die as a martyr. Yes. Then, then they have the assurance of salvation. Absolutely. But otherwise, true. there's no assurance. Even, again, Muhammad did not know for sure whether he was saved or not. Uh, that, yes. That's a horrible thing to think you're yes. having to earn your salvation and no matter how hard you exactly. work. Exactly. You still don't know. Exactly. You still don't know. Exactly. This what is a, true. What a glorious thing it yes. is that, uh, to, uh, to encounter grace. Grace. Absolutely. I was uh, questioning uh, the doctor pharmacy who was uh, giving me the Bible after Muslims, a fanatic in Egypt, attacking a Christian church. I was so upset. I was so, I was so little um, baby Christian. I, I ask her, why people you can defend your church, you defend your people? She, what she said to me, she said to me, Mark, I want to say something to you. Our God, he is not in need for us to defend him or to kill others to defend him or to defend his church. Our God, he is strong enough to defend himself, his name, and his people. Folks, last week we discussed Mark's upbringing in Egypt as a Muslim. He told us that he grew up in a devout Muslim family and had the entire Quran memorized by the time he was 12 years old. He attended al Azhar University in Cairo, the Harvard of the Arab world, where he graduated second in a class of 6,000. He then became a professor of Islamic history at the university. He also became a Muslim imam at a mosque in Giza where the pyramids are located. An imam is the equivalent of a Christian pastor. When Mark began to publicly question some aspects of Islam, he was suddenly arrested, tortured, and nearly killed before he was rescued from prison by a politically powerful uncle. When he returned home, he met a Christian pharmacist who gave him a Bible. He started reading the New Testament and encountered Jesus. And he encountered a sense of inner peace, 
like he had never experienced before. When he revealed that he had become a Christian, his father tried to kill him to save the honor of the family. He finally fled to South Africa, where he was given refuge by a Christian family. Assassins pursued him to South Africa and nearly killed him. He fled to the Congo and finally came to this country where he was granted religious asylum. He now resides in Florida and travels extensively telling the truth about the religion of Islam. Mark is also the best-selling author of three books published by Charisma Press. They are Islam and Terrorism, Islam and the Jews, and his newest, just published, Jesus and Mohammed. Mark, most of our viewers have never read the Quran, and they don't know really how different it is from the Bible. So fill us in. Tell us, give us a comparison here between the Bible and the Quran. Yes, the Quran, uh, as uh, Muslims believe, considered the holy book of Islam. The size of the Quran, it's exactly like the size of the books of the New Testament. And the book um, contain 114 chapters. Which are called surahs. Which called in Arabic term, Arabic language, surahs. Okay. Exactly. And uh, the book is considered, uh, um, as the Muslims believe, the word of Allah who was revealed directly from Allah to Muhammad through the angel Gabriel. Okay. Now, what, what, how does it differ, though? Uh, I, I mean, an average person, let's say an average Christian, has read the Bible, and he's aware that when you start reading the Bible, the Bible has lots of stories, and it tells this story and that story, and, and, and uh, the relationship with God, the nature of God is taught through stories, but you don't find that in the Quran. No, actually the Quran uh, it's, uh, wasn't really organized logically. And when the Quran usually uh, discuss about a specific story, for example, like the story of Abraham, or the story of Joseph, or the story of Moses, you're going to see that these stories, it's in all over the Quran. All over. So you like have... somebody shot a shotgun. And exactly. Just... <laughs> exactly. And uh, it, it's uh, the Quran, even when they translate the Quran into English or another foreign uh, non-Arabic language, uh, they just transfer the meaning of the Quran, you see, to the English or another language. But even the, um, if, you, if even you try to uh, study the Quran, learn about the Quran from the English translation, you're going to miss more than 60% or maybe 70% of the real meaning of the Quran. I find it one of the most difficult books I've ever tried to read in my life uh, yeah. because it is so disjointed. It, it just, there's a sentence here and the next sentence may not have anything to do with that sentence and the one after it may not have anything to do with it. it exactly. It's like in American uh, literature we have what's called stream of consciousness writing where the person just writes whatever pops into his mind and it, he may be talking about uh, a carnival here and, a, and about going to church there and whatever and it just has no relationship one to the other. It's very difficult to follow. Exactly. Exactly. Now, the, the Quran is supposed to be the words of Allah. Yes. The Hadith is another book in the uh, Islamic uh, theology. What is the Hadith? Uh, the Hadith, it's the uh, word of Muhammad. In other words, the Hadith, it means what Muhammad said and what he is dead. So, so it's just, uh, what you call it, it's the record of Muhammad. Okay. His life, his activity, his word, his action, his teaching. And we, the, the Muslim call it hadith. So one, the Quran, is supposed to be the words of God. Yes. The other are the words of Muhammad. Hadith, it's the word of the Prophet Muhammad. And are they considered to be equal or, or what? Uh, Muslim, they are required to believe in the both books. Okay. Uh, Muslim, it's not enough to just believe in the Quran and they decline or deny the, the hadith. According to the Islamic law, if any Muslim going to deny any of the basic teaching of Islam, he will be converted, he will be out of Islam. And hadith, it's one of the most basics, you see, in Islamic faith. Okay. Now, another difference between the Quran and the Bible is that the Bible was written by individuals like Moses or Paul in the New Testament, where they sat down, they wrote letters, or they wrote histories, or whatever. But Muhammad never did really just sit down and write the Quran, no. or write the hadith, did no. he? No. 
No, he just simply, for example, with the Quran, he was usually in trances and he would uh, make statements and people would write those down. Exactly. And all that was compiled later on after his death, wasn't exactly. it? Exactly, yes. And the Hadith is just statements that were compiled by compilers. It might be uh, statements that wives remembered or friends remembered or whatever, and they just kind of put them all together. Exactly. All right. Exactly. Now, in the Quran, there are a lot of contra contradictions as well as in the Hadith, a lot of contradictions. Yes. For example, uh, you can find verses in the Quran that talk about loving Jews and Christians yes. and treating them with respect. Yes. Then you can find verses that talk about killing them. Exactly. How, how do you change his mind? A Muslim, they justify these contradiction uh, by Arabic term and uh, Muslim and Islamic principle. They call it Nasr. Nasr or Nasr. Um, this principle means um, that the um, the the future verse going to come. It's going to decline or cancel the uh, what you call it the, the the previous verse. Okay, so a later verse yes would would cancel out an earlier verse exactly this that is, might contradict with it. They call it nasr. If you ask them, but why Allah do that? They will say he do that for the benefit of Muslims and for the benefit of the human being. For example, and the uh, I remember you giving an example about alcohol. Yes. Give us that example. Exactly. Like, for example, when Muhammad started to uh, preach he about his religion, the people in Arabia at that time, they was alcoholic addicts. They was loves alcohol. They cannot live without alcohol. And he find it so, it's going to be too difficult if he's going to give them a command to stop the drinking alcohol and to obey his command. So what he did, he just gave them um, a halfway command. He said to them, uh, no problem, keep drinking alcohol, but when you're going to come to pray to the mosque, you have to stop drinking alcohol till you finish your prayer, and after you, you finish the prayer, you can go back and drink alcohol again. So after a while, he came back to the man and he said, no, this is, doesn't work. No alcohol going to be allowed anymore. And another verse came and canceled the previous verse. A Muslim, they become very upset, very angry. But how come? We can't do that. And a later verse says, okay, don't worry. Be patient. Believe in Allah. Believe in, in his prophet Muhammad. Believe in his Quranic word. And if you're going to have the ability and you're going to stop drinking alcohol in your life, Allah, he is not going to forget that. He will reward you with a river of alcohol in the paradise the day when he's going to send you to the so paradise. So we go from just drinking alcohol occasionally to not drinking it during prayers to not drinking it at all to you're going to have a river of alcohol in heaven. Exactly. This is the development of the contradiction, you see, of the teaching of the Quran. And you find the same in the attitude toward Jews and Christians. Absolutely. At the beginning, it was one of respect and honor, and then uh, when they did not accept his revelation, he turned against them and began to argue, you must kill them. Absolutely. Firstly, it was a development also was taking place in this subject, in his relationship with the Jews and Christians. Firstly, he started to adore Christians and Jews, saying a wonderful thing, people of God the people who carry his word, the people who protect his word. And later, he said, yes, you are these people. But listen, I am the final prophet, came with a final testament. You have to believe in me, means he started to debate them and reaching out them. So they refused. They asked him sign, the Quran says so. Ask him sign, give us a sign that we can believe. So, and he cannot give a sign. And he went back to Allah and cried before Allah, help me to perform miracle or to give sign to these people that they can follow me. And Allah became very upset with him and said to him, okay, listen, go back to these Jewish people and these Christian people. Tell them Allah gives you plenty miracles in the Old Testament and always you rebels and against him. No more miracles. There is no, it is only one way to submit to Islam, to accept Islam, or to pay the tax. And if you refuse to do this, so, you will be killed. So it was development also taking place in this 
uh, you see, the, in this contradiction of the teaching of the Quran toward the Christian and the Jews. Folks, we're going to take a brief break at this point, and when we return, we're going to ask Mark to tell us how Jesus is portrayed in the Quran. <laughs> Mark, let's talk a little about the Muslim view of Jesus. I, I read in the paper recently where a Muslim imam was invited to speak at a large Christian church in the Chicago area. And when he got up to speak, the very first thing he said was, I want you to know that we Muslims love Jesus as much as you Christians do. Was that an accurate statement or not? Uh, it's not. Uh, absolutely it's not. And uh, the statement of this man, it's a deceitful statement. Why? Because the image of, of Jesus Christ in the brain of Muslims, in the Quran, in the Hadith, in the teaching of Muhammad, it's totally different than the biblical Jesus. The, the, the Quranic teaching and the Islamic G, uh, teaching about Jesus, it's Jesus, just he is the son of Mary. He was born from Mary through a miracle performed by Allah. And he cannot be the son of God. He cannot be God. Uh, he wasn't crucified. He wasn't shed his blood. Um, all his, the biblical view about the identity of Jesus Christ, it's misinterpreted by the Quran and by the Islamic teaching. When this man say a statement like that, he absolutely deceived the Christian congregation and the church as the Muslim Imam after September just, 11, yeah, just trying to get them on his side, exactly right? yeah. deceived the world through the secular media by telling that Islam it's a base for religion. Now, Same way. Let me make sure I understand this. Uh, they they do believe in a miracle birth for for Jesus. They do. But the Mary that they identify is really confused because isn't the Mary, the mother of Jesus, identified in the Quran as Mary, the sister of Moses? Exactly. This is <laughs> one very of confusing. the historical mistakes in the Quran. Yeah, exactly. a, a lot of mistakes about Old Testament because I, I, I get the impression that in his travels, Muhammad probably talked to a lot of Jews, exactly. a lot of Christians, got these stories, but got them all historical, mixed up. Historical mistakes, linguistic yeah. uh, mistakes, yes. and as, if, as we talk about contradiction of, of the Quran, yes. we have to talk also about the mistakes, the historical, yes. the, uh, okay. Now, to get back to Jesus for just a moment, uh, so they, they, they view his birth as miraculous in some way or other, yes. although it's from the wrong person. Yes. And then uh, the, the argument is that uh, he was not God in the flesh, that he was basically just a great prophet, right? Uh, yes, he, he considered one of the uli al-azm min al-rusul, means the greatest prophets, okay. means Muhammad, um, uh, um, Moses, Jesus, Abraham, so they consider him one of the greatest prophets. But Muhammad being the final and greatest of He prophets. is the greatest and he is the final one. Okay. Now, did you say that they deny the crucifixion? They do crucify the yes. The, the, does the Quran deny the crucifixion? Absolutely. Chapter number 4. Okay. Explain, وَمَا قَتَلُوهُ وَمَا صَلَبُوهُ وَلَكِنْ شُبِّهَ لَهُمْ So Jesus just died? <laughs> no. They, he, he was never died. He was never crucified. When just Jews, the Jews, tried to crucify him, Allah took him to heaven. Okay. And he's still alive in heaven. Now, do they believe that there will be a second coming of Jesus? They do believe about the second coming of Jesus, yes. Tell but us about that. The, the Islamic view about the second coming of Jesus, totally different than the biblical view. All what Islam is talking about, his second coming, he's going to do some things. One of these things... He's going to come and to kill all pigs around the world. Kill all pigs? All the pigs. <laughs> yes. Are you serious? Yes. Sayaqtul al-Khinzir. This is the hadith, the word of Muhammad. Okay. It's so. And he's going to come to break the cross. Any cross, wood cross. Break all crosses. All the crosses around the world. Okay. And he's going to stop the jizya, means stop collecting tax from okay. Christians. Okay. So that they can still, uh, and, uh, and he's going, uh, he going to bring justice to the world. Okay. This is the only good point. They, yeah, it, it, he, he just picked it up from the Bible. Yes. But this is the, they view and they believe about his second coming. It's now unbelievable. Mark, your newest book is this one here called Jesus and Muhammad. This has just come out. The subtitle, Profound Differences and Surprising Similarities. Similarities. Let's start yes. with those. 
there are some similarities between Jesus and Muhammad? Uh, there are some similarities, and uh, it's uh, funny similarities. Um, you see, uh, you will amaze when, when you hear about it. It's not similarities in the goodness of God. No. It's just uh, a normal similarities like, um, like the way he uh, grew up, the way he was uh, acting when he was a little uh, child. Like, for example, Islam speaks as Jesus, um, as the Bible told us about prophecy, prophesied about the coming Messiah. The Islamic side, they say there is prophecy, prophesied about the coming final prophet. Okay. okay. Uh, when Jesus, he was a little uh, boy and yes. just go to the temple every time. Yes, and Simeon prophesied. Take, exactly, yes. yeah. Yes. Uh, exactly. Simeon prophesied over him. There is another Arabian guy, his name Waraka bin Naufal. It was the cousin of his first wife. Yes. They said he prophesied about his coming, okay. uh, about Jesus going to the temple and debating the Jewish yes. leaders, uh, religious leaders. Muhammad, he go to the center of the, uh, the religious center of Mecca, called al kaaba at that time, debating with religious people. Or you see the, uh, so there is uh, sim some similarities like Jesus chose uh, 12 disciples yes. to spread his message. Muhammad chose 12 um, we can say friends or 12 leaders to lead his army and his military in exporting Islam out of Arabia. To so you're really talking Arabia. about some similarities that are not really all that significant. Exactly. But yeah. the contrasts are something else. And to get into those contrasts, tell us a story Very of the Muslim woman that you met in South Africa. Very deeply. Jesus Christ came to bring hope, to bring forgiveness. Uh, to bring peace and love. Muhammad came to bring revenge, hatred, uh, 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 lust, uh, 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 killing, uh, bloodshed. Uh, this is a, this, it's a very obvious. Um, like for example, Jesus Christ as the uh, Bible telling us in John chapter 8 about the woman who was committed adultery and brought yes. to Jesus by the Jewish people. Jewish people, they knew at that time that this woman, according to the law of Moses, she will be stoned. But they came to test this great preacher and teacher in Jerusalem. What are you going to say about that? And you know the story. He confronted them. He asked them, if any one of you live with no sin, just come and stone her. They, because they knew the fact about themselves that they are sinners. They left the woman in front of him and they just walked away. Jesus came to the woman and asked her, there is anybody, any one of these people judge you? She said, no. He said to her, even me, go back and sin no more. In other words, Jesus, by what he did and said to this woman, he fulfilled his word that the Son of Man came not to kill or to destroy, but to give life. That he is the way, he is the truth, he is the life. He now came to happened? bring life. What happened when a woman in adultery was brought to Muhammad? It's the history repeated itself in an amazing way when 600 years later, Muhammad, received Muslim woman adultery, uh, Muslim woman was commit adultery. And the reason that uh, Muslim brought her to him because the Islamic judgment of adultery wasn't established yet in Islamic law. So Muhammad asked the woman, do you really commit adultery? She said, yes, Prophet, and I'm pregnant now. And he asked her, fine, go back home, wait till you deliver your baby, and wait with your baby, nursing him or her, and for two years, and then, bring your baby and come back to me. She did. She delivered the baby. She nursed the baby for two years. And she carried her baby, and she gave the baby a little piece of bread, you see, to eat it, just to show Muhammad that the, bo the, the baby, he can eat now. He is not in need for, milk, for nursing anymore. When she came to him, Muhammad took the child from her, commanded his friend to dug a hole in the ground, they put her in hole, only her head was above the ground. They stoned her and killed her in front of her baby. Now folks, let me tell you something very amazing about this. When Mark was in South Africa, he was living with a Christian family and they invited him to uh, go meet with a Muslim woman they had met who was living in abject poverty. And when he went in there, she was greatly honored when she found out he had been a professor at Al-Hazar University. Oh, she was so honored. And uh, she... Uh, uh, began to honor him and he said well you don't understand I'm not a, a Christian anymore I, I mean a, a Muslim anymore I have become a Christian then she was astonished and, and upset 
and and uh, she asked him why he would uh, would would leave uh, the Islamic religion, and he told her the story. He told her the story about Jesus and Muhammad. This story he just told you. He told us that story, and the woman began to weep and weep and weep. And he said, "What? Why are you sobbing?" She said, "I am that woman. I am that woman. I am living here in abject poverty because I committed adultery. My family's trying to kill me. I'm hiding out. I want Jesus." I don't want Muhammad. And through the telling of that story, she accepted Jesus. She accepted the Lord Jesus Christ. He delivered her baby. Her baby was baptized in Baptist praise Church. Lord. And we just praise the Lord for that. The whole book, Jesus and Muhammad, that tells stories about amazing co uh, uh, parallels between the life of Muhammad and Jesus where they had similar situations and shows the difference in the way in which they responded to them. Mark, our time is almost up. We have just about one minute. Would you just look directly in the camera and talk to any Muslim who may be watching this program? What would you say to any Muslim? I would, I would like to say to any Muslim man or woman in any place around the world, Islam will not give you peace. Muhammad will never lead you to a right way to connect with God and to experience his love, his forgiveness, his peace. There is only Jesus Christ can give you the peace in your life, can forgive your sin because he is the Lord of Lord, he is the Prince of Peace, he is the forgiver, he the one came to tell us about the secret of heaven, he is the one came to connect us with the God Father. Muslims, man or woman, please think carefully about your life first, the condition where you live under. Look about the miserable life which Muslims living in any part around the world. Hatred, bloodshed, killing, conflict, terrorist. There is, there is only way for you to get out of this mess is just to Accept the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior. And by meeting with Him face to face, you're going to experience the gift which you're going to receive through Him. Your sin will be forgiven. Your heart will fill with love. And you're going to experience the forgiveness. And you're going to feel and experience the freedom from sin and from the bondage of Satan. And you're going to find your way to God. And you're going to find you are in the right place. I pray for you and the power of my Lord Jesus Christ. Able to reach your heart in the same way he did with me. I want to thank you for tuning in this week. I hope the program has been a blessing to you, and I hope you'll be back with us next week. Until then, this is Dave Reagan speaking for Lamb and Lion Ministries saying, Look up, be watchful, for our redemption is drawing near. <laughs>